Uh, thank you, Manuel. Okay, next talk is by Marek Biskop from UCLA, and he will talk about exceptional points for planar maps. <laughs> it was planar random maps. I was reading your title there. All right, so it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I've never been to Argentina. It's not happening uh, this time, I'm afraid, but uh, you know, this is the next best thing. I can do my talk from, you know, from you know, my, my flight in, in South Bohemia, actually. So this is based on joint work, actually two papers, one written with Yoshihiro Abe, who is now at Gakushuin University in Japan, and Sang Chu Lee, who is my former graduate student, who until now has been at UCLA, and I have no idea where he's going. Uh, after this, because we kind of lost track of each other due to the um, Okay, so I, I want to, uh, you know, essentially I'll continue the topic that Oren mentioned, but here is the overarching, overarching theme of the talk. Let me minimize the, uh, the gallery here. Okay, so the overarching theme is to describe extremal or perhaps more precisely exceptional values of various logarithmically correlated processes. And this, this program has been uh, completed for a, a number of cases, special cases, of which I guess in chronological order, it's branching Brown in motion. Then I should also add branching Ren walk, which we've heard in previous talks, uh, then two dimensional Gaussian free field, and then a couple of related processes, like some other Gaussian logarithmically cor correlated processes and whatnot. And so the point is to actually step out of these uh, sort of specific uh, examples and, and go beyond that. And, and so what I will talk about today is the local time of two-dimensional simple random walk. Okay, let me see if I can, uh, okay. So, uh, so here's more motivation. This basically repeats what Oren has said. Uh, so I guess the, uh, the, the starting point of looking at these various exceptional points of simple random walk, go back to Erdős and Taylor in 1960, uh, where they basically ask the question, how much time does the simple random walk spend in its most favorite or more, most frequently visited point? Okay, and what they did is that, so I, in my case, I'm talking about discrete time random walk. This will be the case uh, pretty much uh, the whole beginning of the talk. So if I take a simple random walk on Z2, uh, started at zero for simplicity, define the local time as simply the number of times the walk visits X in the first n steps, then Erdős and Taylor proved that in two dimensions, the maximum value is squeezed between two constant times log n squared. Okay, and, and as Oren pointed out, then it took 40 years to, to actually uh, derive the asymptotic value, apologies, uh, of this maximum. Uh, if you scale the maximum divide by log n squared, this converges well, I wrote print probability, but perhaps the result is actually almost surely to a constant and the constant is in, in this normalization is four over pi. Okay, and uh, of course, you know, you can say what happens, what makes two dimensions special. So here's a quick run through in, in, in three and higher dimensions, the transients tell you that you only get logarithmic asymptotics. And, and in fact, the limit law is Poissonian in, in dimension one, you, you, get, you get a limit law, which is essentially expressible in terms of a brown emotion, but you have at most three maximizers, which is kind of a additional one dimensional uh, feature. And this is a result of Ballantov. Okay, so the question really here is what can we go beyond the limit uh, leading order and what's the limit law? And, and Oren talked about this. Um, okay, so here's uh, another thing which, uh, which appeared in the previous talk is that you can look at the thick points or lambda thick points, which are the ones where the local time is lambda multiple of its uh, purported uh, leading order maximum. And in the paper, they also quantified the leading order number of such points for a random walk of time length n. And, and it has this nice parallel scaling where you write uh, with, with n squared. n squared is the, um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, the way I'm writing this is actually wrong, I think, because n is the time length. So I think that the n is actually this. So the two is not there. It's n to the one minus lambda. So there's kind of a linear behavior in the exponent, but the, the, the control of the, lead, of the sub leading order term is not really done. And this was done by, by, by Jürgen in 2019, where he actually provided the full description of the limit law in these uh, subcritical cases. Okay, so uh, 
I want to actually move on to slightly because of the purpose of the talk. I want to move to a slightly different setting, which is the setting where the where the random walk. Uh, apologies, I have to actually. I forgot to turn off my tea kettle, and I don't want my kitchen to to be on fire by the time I finish. Okay, so uh, in a in a paper which came five years later, uh, uh, this uh, 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 this quartetto of authors also looked at the situation of points which I call avoided. They call late. Uh, uh, of, of random walk on, on a, on a two-dimensional uh, planar-like uh, domain. I mean, they specifically look at torus, but you can, of course, look at other domains uh, with a reflecting boundary condition. So, so let's talk about the torus, specifically define a theta and late point as, the, as a point in the set. So the, it's the point where the local time is still zero. So the point has not been visited by the walk by the time Kn and Kn has the specific asymptotics and the asymptotics is cooked up in such a way that theta equals one is exactly the time where these points start to disappear and this is exactly the statement that they proved is that the uh, the set is empty once theta is larger than one with high probability while what when theta is between zero and one the cardinality of the set has this uh, parallel behavior where again theta appears uh, linearly in the exponent Okay, and again, the question is, what can we say about the set beyond the leading order, the number of vertices and, and so on. And again, just a quick reminder that in dimension three, this, this question becomes much easier. And in fact, there is an extremely strong coupling to IED random variables of the points in the set, which implies Poissonian limits. The, the latest result on this is by Jason Miller and Perla Susi. Uh, th there's also a very close relation to a big open problem in this field, which is the cover time problem, uh, where a lot of progress was done by Ding, Lee, and Perez, and Ding in, in you know, about 10 years ago, and then most recently, actually, by, by Azar Cortinez, or in Ludor, and Santiago Salietti. Uh, this is a, a result on a tree where they actually describe the scaling limit of the actual time where Ln uh, becomes empty. Okay, so here are some runs of a uh, of a random walk, so that you uh, we have the benefit of a computer talk, so we can see some simulations. So this is a run of a simple random walk, started at the center of the box and run until it exits, and I think it exited somewhere here, I think, in this point. And this is the local time profile for that. So you see that at first the support set of the of the random walk is very fractal, but so is also the distribution of the local time on that. And this fractal nature of the range and the, and the set of values of the local time has been attested by very specific uh, mathematical results in these uh, papers already. Okay, so here's, uh, here's another simulation. This will take a little bit longer to load because I made it for 2000 steps. So this is actually a simple random walk run until a theta multiple of the cover time of the square. Okay, so theta is a, is a constant and and uh, if if theta is a 0 0.1, which means you know 10% of the cover time, the the set of visited vertices looks like this. So a set of not visit not visited vertices looks like this. And when theta is already 30% of the cover time, it's thinned out quite considerably, and it becomes very almost empty uh, by the time you get close to one. So it makes little sense to go beyond that in terms of visualization. Okay, so the problem that I that I want to study it has to do with uh, you know addresses the regime of the theta multiple of the cover time. So theta will always mean the multiple of the cover time uh, as a time scale that I'm looking at the walk. I will look at the random walk in planar domains, which approximate in a in a suitable sense a, a bounded open nice set in R D. Okay, I will use this to, in fact, define a very specific discretization. There are some, we can be a little bit more general, general than this, but, but this is fine. So you essentially take your continuum set, suppose it may have holes, and then you put a lattice on top of it. So, you know, just think of sort of taking the lattice over this and, oops, it's a little hard to draw with a mouse and 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 then you discretize the set you just keep the vertices. and the reason why we have this kind of a strange description is because your set can have a actually a slit and we want that slit to be respected at the lattice level as well 
Okay, and but the problem is that that if I want to run a random walk on this, the random walk will eventually leave the set. So I need to find some return mechanism. So what you can do, a natural thing, is to put a reflecting boundary condition. So which means you basically forbid the random walk to leave the set. Uh, that's not something I can actually handle right now. So the return mechanism is that you introduce something. What do we call a boundary vertex? So you we we all of the edges emanating outside to this set are still present, but they're all wired to one point, which we call a boundary vertex. And that's the situation that's depicted here in this picture. Okay, and then and then uh, I will write PX for the law of the random walk on this set. Rho will be my boundary vertex. And I will actually introduce a local time, which is already suitably scaled. So I'm gonna scale that the actual time by the total degree of this graph. And that turns out to be the right thing. And then I normalize the local time by the degree at vertex X, which for all but the boundary vertex is, is just four for the boundary vertex is the degree of the, of the boundary. Okay, so that's, this is the parameterization in which uh, results are stated because that's, that's the convenient one. Okay, and uh, you can then say, what's the, what's the typical time scale of this, of this quantity? And uh, it's, uh, uh, here is a result of that. So my TN will be actually then uh, still diverging. So this is the TN that I will plug for this T that I have here. And my time will be, of course, the degree of this graph is roughly n squared. And the time that I want to observe the walk for is roughly n squared, log n squared. So my TN will itself will go proportional to log n squared. And the constant of proportionality is this 2G theta. And G encodes sort of the typical normalization of my local time that I have, or, or the one that I'm using. Uh, so you can just think of it as kind of a placeholder, which depends on how you normalize your, your, your time. Okay, and the theta equals one, in this case, again, will correspond to, to the cover time, as we'll see. So if I look at, so the first theorem is that, you know, setting the scales, how big these quantities are. So typical value of this LTX is actually the value of TN, okay, because, because we're kind of distributing the local time uh, uh, equally over the vertices. And, and so the typical value of LTNX will be 2G theta log N squared. But if I look at the maximum value, it will have a different constant. And that constant is this 2G squared of theta plus one squared. And if I look at the minimum, it will be 2G squared of theta minus one squared, except when this quantity is already less than zero, in which case I just take maximum zero. Okay, so, so these are sort of the three scales. So the typical scales is this, okay? The maximum is this and the minimum is this. And the minimum can be zero and it ceases to be zero exactly at the point once theta becomes larger than one. Okay, and that's exactly what marks the, the, the time of the cover time. So again, the actual time of the walk is order n squared log n squared. And the TN tells me the typical uh, local time, a uh, local time at a typical point. Okay, and so here's the first theorem, and I, I have a bunch of theorems, and I will start with the one which I find sort of more, which I find easiest to communicate, which, which is the one that has to do with points uh, avoided by a simple random walk, which I call avoided points, and I call late points uh, by others. Okay, uh, so the statement is as follows, so there exist Borel measures, which are random, they're almost surely diffuse, which means that they have no atoms with probability one, they are indexed by a continuous parameter lambda, so it's a family of measures, and they are positive and finite on every open set, almost surely, not empty open set, almost surely. Okay, and then if I, if my TN is scaled in this way, then the set of so then this empirical measure, so that's a measure which assigns a, a unit mass to every point scaled by n, uh, where local time is zero. But of course, the number of such points will blow up to infinity. So I need to divide by some normalizing factor. So this is the normalizing factor. This in law, this in the random measure converges to this ZD of square root of theta. Okay. And this, of course, square root of theta is for, uh, I guess I should have said that. Uh, uh, this, is, this result is, of course, for theta uh, less than one. Okay. Theta less than one and uh, larger than zero. 
apologies for that. This is, of course, part of the theorem. Oh, it is, it is actually stated here. Okay, and what is this constant? This constant has the n squared term, and the Tn itself is proportional to log n squared. So you see that you get more powers of n in here. So this actually will behave like, uh, like the quantity n to power two times one minus theta, right? Minus theta. I've unfortunately misplaced my uh, my uh, iPad and pencil, uh, so I can I have to write it like this. So so this is to the leading order. It's this quantity that we have seen before. So this gives us the the, the number of avoided points in a box, but not only to the leading order, but to the actual number. So if your TN has kind of sub leading order terms, they will of course affect this. Okay, but the important thing is that there's a limit law for the measure. Okay, so the other results, they actually relate to the concept of thick and thin points. So in this case, we actually have thick and thin points because if you remember, we had kind of three levels, right? The typical level of the, of the, of, of the local time, the maximum level of the local time and the minimum level of the local time. And here they are, okay? These are the quantities in here, the maximum and minimum and the typical level. And so I can say, you know, I can kind of put a line in here and, 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 and associate a lambda with this and say that every, all the values which are above here, I'll call lambda thick. And then, or I can put a lambda negative lambda in here. And I can say everything which is below this level is lambda thin, where the lambda of course is, uh, is now, um, actually the, the negative is probably not the right thing to do because the, 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 the level that I put here is actually root theta plus lambda squared then root theta uh, minus lambda squared. And I have to say that kind of coming up with this right definition uh, is what makes a lot of calculations easier because as you can see there are a lot of squares and these squares when you invert them yield square roots and if your parameterization is not done this way, then then you always uh, update a huge mess. So this is this is the right way to define lambda thick and lambda thin points in this context. Okay, so so here is you know here is a, a, a plot of the lambda thick points and lambda thin points again for val values very mildly differing from the actual uh, uh, center value because otherwise there will be very few. And of course, they are for the same sample over there in walk. So when there is a lot of thin points, there is a few, there are a few thick points and so on. But this picture clearly shows a very, uh, very strong fractal structure of these sets. Okay. And here's a theorem that describes the structure. And, and, and in this theorem, I'll bundle everything together by allowing lambda to be negative in this case. And the definition of the Z lambda negative is just the value at Z lambda positive. So there's a symmetry, which I, I have no kind of explanation for except that it just comes out to be that way okay so if i now as if i consider a measure which again module normalization is the empirical measure that records the scaled position of a point and the value of ltx centered by some an and this an will be exactly the level that corresponds to the lambda thick or lambda thin points depending on the sign of lambda so i'm looking at sort of the distribution of the local time around this centering value the you need to scale this and this is another mystery by square root of 2 a n to get kind of a clean result uh, then if you normalize it by this uh, deterministic constant which only depends on tn and a n and n and a bunch of logs and things like that then this measure actually converges to up to constant again the measure that we have seen before these are the same measures we've seen before and now, of course, because you retain information also about the law kind of in quotes of this of these deviations, then you get kind of this exponential uh, measure as uh, uh, a product with the exponential measure over here. Okay, and this is this is the theorem that comes out of the comes out of the calculation. Okay, so so the question now in this uh, in this context is that what are these Z's and to explain what these Z's are, I will have to bring up the notion of a Gaussian free field because essentially the whole result is based on the fact that, uh, that at the level around the cover time, the local time has a very strong coupling to uh, Gaussian free fields that can be used to derive these, uh, these conclusions. Okay, so let me start by recalling very quickly. So what is the Gaussian free field on a domain? So I have a domain, dn is a subset of z2, or in fact, you know, it could be any 
graph at this point, but it's uh, this is what we are interested in. He says a centered Gaussian process whose covariance is the green function of the Simperen walk. And in my normalization, I have to normalize the green function by the degree because the degree distribution is the is the invariant is the invariant measure in this case. And you know that's constant except for the for the for the root, of course. Uh, but at the sorry, not for the root uh, for the uh, boundary vertex. But in the boundary vertex, this function is zero. So this is just a constant essentially. And the important thing about this green function is that it allows uh, uh, a very precise large and asymptotics and this asymptotics differs what, what depending on whether you're looking at a kind of a diagonal term or an off diagonal term where off diagonal means that you're looking at two points which are distance or n from each other uh, if you look at the diagonal term then you get a logarithm you get a constant which is known but it's not really that interesting, but it's computable. But it's not really, you know, anything particularly nice. And then there's a then there's a scalable uh, x dependence. So now, depending on where you are in the domain, you get a logarithm of the conformal radius of d from from uh, from from that point. And then the quantities which follow are uh, vanish in the in the limit as 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 uh, as and tends to infinity. And in fact, in a uniform way, once x is deep inside the domain, and if if x and y are separated by order n, then in fact this quantity is order unity, and it approximates well a continuum green function on D, which has a logarithmic singularity at the uh, you know at, on the diagonal. Okay, and so for the Gaussian free field where all these results will kind of be drawn from uh, you know similarly to what we discussed for the local time the progress was by first understanding the so you you have to understand the the extremal values of this process and the first thing to look at was the maximum and this is the result of both house and ocean and jacomi from 2001 where they identified the leading order of the of the of the maximum, and this is where this uh, this magic G comes from, really, as the asymptotics of the green function in the previous slide. And David looked at the thick points, which are those where the uh, the, the Gaussian free field is at least a lambda multiple of its maximum. And here you see again this parallel scaling, but here we have a lambda squared because somehow the square of the Gaussian free field corresponds to the to the local time. Okay, and then with Oren, we uh, we proved the paper was published in 2019, but I think we did this in 2015. Uh, we we studied the local time, uh, the, the the distribution of these uh, thick points, which we called intermediate points for some reason at that point. Uh, these are level sets of a Gaussian free field where we look at the distribution. We look where we try to record those values in this measure. Which are near this a hat n, and a hat n is the is the is the quantity which behaves like for the the cutoff for the lambda thick points. And again, you know, we we basically derive a formula for for the limit distribution or or a representation uh, that if you normalize this measure by this deterministic factor, it converges to uh, a measure z d lambda. This is not exactly the same measure as I had before, but it will be closely related. There's an exponential uh, term in here. There's a rising constant, which can all be expressed in terms of these various quantities that you saw that before. This is ZD lambda measure. This is called the normalized Liouville quantum gravity measure at parameter lambda. And this is where I would need the normalization is this is where I would need the, um, the, the conformal radius as well. Okay, and I should just say that the result by by Jogo in 2019 basically proves the version of this theorem for the lambda thick points of the simple n walk run until it exits a domain. Okay, and the uh, limit no, I mean we've also looked at the limit law of the maximum, but that's not really relevant for this talk. Okay, and and the point is that that in order to describe the measures that, that I, I brought up in the, in the previous theorems for the random walk, I have to tell you something about the, uh, the, the, the thick points of a Gaussian free field, however, conditioned on the total sum of the Gaussian free fields over the domain to be zero. Okay, so the, this, this is a Gaussian random variable, so it's continuously distributed, so I can condition on it. And the point is that the question is, what's the limit law of this extremal process conditional on this? And it turns out that, that, that it has a similar representation as the unconditional result, but you have a slightly different measure. And that measure, I will write 
the ZD zero, and that measure has the form as the property that it that it kind of factors against an independent log normal random variable. This is not really a log normal random variable because there have, I have X dependence in here. There's some function, which I will show you a plot of. So you, you take measure, you multiply this by this exponential factor, which depends on X, but there's just one, one Gaussian random variable. Y is a standard, well, it's not a standard normal, but it's a normal with some variance, which is computable from here. And all together, these two, this independent pro product of independent random variables, this gives me the law of the original ZD. Okay, so the way I should think about this is that ZD zero is the law of ZD condition on the total integral of the Gaussian free field to be zero. But of course, in the limit, this is a singular, uh, this is a singular thing to do. Okay, the function that appears there has this uh, has this kind of a bump type of form. It's actually a solution of some second order PDE. It's not really relevant. The important thing is that in all of these measures that we have seen for the simple and walk can be written using these zero average measures for the GFF and this kind of slightly perturbed log normal factor. If I didn't have this minus one in here, then altogether they would they would give me back my ZD, my 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 measure, my level quantum gravity. But with this minus one, I don't get that. I get something different. And that's why I need to write it in this in this product form. Okay, so somehow the, the, the ZD measure is modulo a constant is some kind of a log normal interpolation of the measure that describes the thick points of a Gaussian free field and thick points of a Gaussian free field conditioned on total average being being zero. Okay, so I have, a, uh, you know, I'm sort of in the same situation as Oren. I, I have three minutes to describe the, the proof idea. So the proof is, you know, relatively simple in terms of strategy. You know, the idea is to prove tightness and then use the tightness to characterize the law of subsequent limits. The tightness is not hard to prove because you, you just basically do first moment calculations. And because the law of the local time at one point is very explicit in the parameterization that, that okay, I, I will not be very, Precise, but in the parameterization of the in the of the time spent at the boundary vertex, you can actually do that. <coughs> the trouble is that that uh, proving the the characterization is is harder because either you you proceed by explicit second moment calculations and then you get a huge mess. So I guess what 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 Abe and I have discovered is that you can you can actually do a much of that using the what's called the second Raynaud theorem or also known as Dinkin isomorphism. So let me at least uh, say a bit, a, a bit about that. So, and that's exactly the, uh, you know, the reason why I have to choose a slightly different time parameterization. So in this case, I have to move to continuous time. So I, I just put a constant speed uh, version of the random walk. Uh, I, my sums become integrals, but I still normalize by the degree. And then my, now I look at the time, the first, this is the first time that the local time at the root I apologize, calling the root, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a root, it's the boundary vertex, it's the vertex that I've wired the boundary to, is equal to T, and then my L hat T is now the local time in this parameterization. And this parameterization has the property that at the boundary vertex, L hat T is always equal to T on an expectation for the random walk started at the boundary vertex. This is true, in fact, for all vertices, so somehow that homogenizes everything quite a bit. But more importantly, and this is really the, the, the upshot of this, uh, of this isomorphism theorem, uh, you can find a coupling of an independent Gaussian free field on this, on this graph. This is stated for kind of general graphs, but for us, the V is the DN union with, with the boundary vertex. Uh, so you take a Gaussian free field, square it, take a half, add it to a local time at time T, and what you find out that in distribution, this is equal to the Gaussian free field plus root two T squared over two. And then with a little bit of extra tweak, you can in fact make this an almost sure identity. So you can couple two copies of a Gaussian free field and a local time at time T in this parameterization such that this holds as an almost sure identity and the quantities on the left-hand side are independent. Okay, and now the idea is, is essentially canonical is that we can, because we know the extremal values of this, we can perhaps understand the extremal values of this guy by kind of transferring the property from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Okay, so suppose that I could basically cross the second, this, this 
second term uh, out over there. Then in that case, I would basically I would have an identity that LT and X is just one half of this local time squared. So if you tell me that L, this has to be some quantity a n, okay, then I can solve the equation backwards. And then if if my LT is roughly this, then my H on the right hand side is either that or that. Okay. Now it depends whether you know which which of them adds and which of them subtracts whether this is bigger or smaller but only one of the two, one of the two values will typically contribute this is not true for the avoided points but it's true in, in in this case okay and so then your h becomes the 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 root 2 an you know then you then the the level sets of this at this extremal value correspond to the level sets of this quantity for instance say okay and this if i now plug in the asymptotics the asymptotics that I chose, and this is the asymptotic that I choose, and this is where exactly this parameterization becomes relevant, you find out that the theta term subtracts and your, your A hat N behaves like two G lambda log N. So the, the level set of the local time at this level corresponds to the local time, to the thick points of a Gaussian free field at this level. And this is something where the results with Oren are applicable. Okay, so I guess this is, uh, you know, this is all I can say. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, is to control the effect of the Gaussian free field on the left hand side. And that's that's, in fact, the main part of the proof. And what you have to do is that you have to uh, you have to show that the effect is negligible, that the field will take typical values on these on these points and that you that will result into a convolution identity. And you have to solve this convolution identity. Solving it is not a hard, but showing that the solution is unique is usually hard. And then in all three cases has to be done differently. And I have a number of slides that describe this, but I'm actually not going to uh, be able to tell you that. So let me just uh, thank you for attention and maybe leave uh, further details to the discussion. Thank you very much, Marek, for this nice talk. Really nice. Um, let's, thanks, Marek. Uh, is there any question or comment? Okay, so while people think about questions, I will ask you a, a more technical thing. Is a, so this I, I didn't understand well this uh, extra point. So this is equivalent to say that uh, after some geometric time you jump to a point uh, chosen uh, uniformly in the. Um, yeah, yeah. So so you know the the. The setup of the graph that I'm ultimately considering my random walk on is cooked up in such a way that I can directly plug into the results for the Gaussian free field. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> somehow, okay. Somehow nature shows you what's what's simpler. If, if I had 20, 10 minutes more of the of, of my time, I would also explain to you that if you actually try to do, if you if you say no, I don't want this, I want to do it on a torus. Then, then you could still do much of what I said, but your Gaussian free field would be the pinned Gaussian free field, pinned at the point where the random walk starts. Mm. That Gaussian free field has very similar extremal structure, except that it has some non-trivial uh, additional random term, which essentially is constant, which, which you know, gives you kind of a Gaussian fluctuations. Yeah. And that makes it much harder to track the level set because essentially it moves the level set by a random amount that's not commensurate with the fluctuations that you're looking at. And so essentially this paper is, you know, what, what I described to you is the result of two papers where we peel off the basic ideas. And in fact, in a third paper, which, which we may not write, or I may have to write alone or just maybe with Abe alone, uh, we in fact want to tackle the idea without the boundary vertex. Okay. okay, so the other question is also <coughs> curiosity. How, how do you do to couple almost surely this uh, local time with the um, Gaussian free field to get another Gaussian free field? Yeah, yeah, let me explain that to you. This is easy. So I, I, I will flash back the, uh, the theorem, okay? So, so, so this, this theorem of, you know, this is actually attributed to Eisenbaum, Caspi, Marcus, Rosen, and she. There's a number of these isomorphism theorems. And they're, oh, yeah. usually, they're usually stated at where this is stated in law. 
And the proof of these theorems usually go by taking the Laplace transform of the left hand side and convert and, and showing that it equals the Laplace transform of the right hand side. Okay. Uh, how do you actually provide it as a coupling? Well, that that so what what this tells you is that I can I can construct a pro, uh, uh, I, I simply take a product of the distribution of the local time and the independent Gaussian free field, okay, and then conditional on the values of this at a point, I sample the signs of this quantity from the Gaussian free field measure conditioned on these values to be fit. Okay. So because we know that their laws are the same, I can I can proclaim the, the sum of these squares on the left hand sides to be the square of my purported Gaussian free field. So I know I have access to the squares. And now I just need to find the signs. And the signs you simply sample from the Gaussian free field measure, conditional on the squares being given. Okay. I see. This is attributed to Tsai, is not ah, okay. Okay, ah, okay, but but you start we, you start knowing that this is true. I mean, the, you right. start we, you have the isomorphism theorem. Right. And you need so let, let me in fact ask you know because you know it's always good to start or finish with some open questions. Uh, once you finish with one less open question, then one starts right at least. So uh, so here is here is an open question in here. Can you do this coupling for all t at the same time? Huh. So we know that this this is true. So the way you can think of this is that is is that somehow the quantity as as a function of t. This is like a stationary measure of of a, of a process such that if I add a local time, this this parameter which is in here just ups by 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 a constant. Okay. So the question is, can I do this coupling in such a way that I actually have a couple of process where at each section I have a Gaussian free field. Okay. And if, you, if you do this, you would make life of the of the people working in this field much easier in many respects. This is a really nice question to think about. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, thank you very uh, much. Let's thank uh, Marek again. Sorry, can I still ask a quick question? Ah, uh, well, we have a yeah, must quick quick question and very quick answer also because we we are over time or not. Okay, yes. sorry, it, it just like, a, I don't know if it's possible or science fiction, but uh, is it anything known about different levels at the same time? Because at each point you fixed lambda, right? So can, can you, is it possible to say anything about uh, lambda fake, uh, that a point is lambda fake provided that it's lambda prime fake uh, for lambda and lambda prime one smaller than the other? I don't know if that makes sense. I think you're basically asking about the joint distribution of these yes. different lambda sets. Yeah, precisely. Uh, I think the answer yes, but it's not pretty because you can do I think on at only finite number of sets at a time. It's not like that you can mm -hmm. think of it as a process. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, because it's kind of irregular. irregular it, yeah, in the continuum you can do this, but you know, but to describe the full scaling limit, it's one of the open question, of course, in a field. If can you actually make sense of all of the lambda thick points at the same time? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Marek. So, in two minutes, with one minute, we start with Avelio. So, Avelio, are you there? Yes. Hi. Yes. Yes. Uh, here. So, can, can you do you want to 